This is Steve Schwetz. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. You know, when Dr. McGee first began teaching on the radio, his vision was to reach only the greater L.A. area where he lived. Well, within a few years after beginning the five-year Through the Bible series, people joined the Bible bus from across the United States and in a few additional countries as well. And even though he never planned to go into other languages, he said, I'd love to blanket the earth so everyone could hear the Word of God. But I guess I can't do that. I'm satisfied just wherever the Lord wants me to fling out this seed. So I'll just fling it out. Well, today, we're still following the Lord's lead as he opens doors today in almost every country of the world. So as Dr. McGee's dream in many ways has become a reality through the Bible, even reaches into some of the hardest to reach places on earth, both geographically and culturally isolated regions where the gospel has never reached before. Places like Nepal, for example. It's one of the most isolated places that you could ever hope to visit. And yet today, God's word taught on through the Bible is changing lives. I personally had the privilege to visit through the Bible's family in Nepal, and it's amazing. You want proof for yourself? Well, listen to this great letter. God is a miracle worker. He can change the heart and mind of his people, and I am an example of this. I used to hate Christians. I used to hate everything about them. But one of my neighbors told me about the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation we are offered when we believe in him. She gave a schedule of the programs broadcasted by TWR Nepal. After listening to Through the Bible, my thoughts changed. This program came in my life as a mediator to connect me with Jesus Christ. This is really outstanding. Well, thanks to the prayer and financial partnerships with our listeners, the seed of God's word is being flung out, as Dr. McGee said, in over 120 languages all around the world. And if you were with us yesterday, you probably can guess where I'm going with this. Turn in your Bible to Matthew 13, our text for today, and we'll continue studying Jesus' parable about the man who sowed good seed in his field, and then something happened. We'll pick up at Matthew 13 at verse 24 shortly. Let's pray. Father, we pray that as we fling out the seed of your word, that it'll land on good soil, producing a crop a hundredfold. Would you use your spirit to draw people to your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, here in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, we have that second major discourse, as we indicated last time, and here you have the mystery parables of the kingdom. We have here about, oh, seven or eight parables, and they're all drawn from the commonplace. Our Lord took these things that were at the fingertips of those people in that day, something they could see and know in order to give them great spiritual truth. Someone has put it in a very lovely poem like this. He talked of grass and wind and rain and fig trees and fair weather and made it his delight to bring heaven and the earth together. He spoke of lilies, vines and corn, the sparrow and the raven, and words so natural yet so wise were on men's hearts engraven. Now, last time we saw the parable of the sower, and we saw that it would be called a kingdom of heaven condition. This is not the church we're talking about here. It's the kingdom of heaven. And I believe that today, this is the picture of the present hour, and it's bigger than the church, the kingdom of heaven, because it encompasses the earth. And it's the reign of the heavens over the earth, as we've indicated. Now God's program today is through the church, and the church is a called-out body. And that means he's calling out a people to his name. And you have, therefore, a kingdom of heaven condition today. God's carrying on his program. But notice now in this next parable, which he interprets, by the way, makes it very clear. Verse 24, And another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Well, you see, he picks up actually where he left off before because he told then about a sower going forth to sow and what happened to the seed. And we found out that only one-fourth of it ever got into good ground, and the other three-fourths are folk that hear the word but they do not respond to it. They're not saved. And your percentage here is about a fourth. 
Unfortunately, my percentage is less than that of the people that I preach to. The unsaved, I would say, less than a fourth. Frankly, we feel that if one out of ten of those who respond to our invitation is genuine, that our batting average is good. And frankly, I find that other Christian workers and evangelists today, I know a very prominent evangelist and a member of his team said that only 3% of their converts, that is only three out of a hundred, could be considered genuine. Well, that, may I say, it reveals that our batting average today is not too good, but we thank God that it is that good. That's the picture today. We're in a kingdom of heaven situation, giving out the word of God, and this is what happens to it. But here's another facet, another phase of the kingdom of heaven. It's a picture of a man which sowed good seed, but wait a minute. But while men slept, not the sower, <laughs> The sower is the Lord Jesus. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. But I do, maybe you do. While man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, we have an enemy. We know who the enemy is, is Satan. And he sows tares. That's false doctrine. And there's a great deal of that type of sowing today. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. You see, at first, you couldn't tell the difference. Very frankly, a lot of the cults and isms, at first, they sound very good. It's about that 12th, the 13th, the 14th lesson. That's the one you're going to have to watch, not the first one. Somebody said to me some time ago, Dr. McGee, you ought not to criticize so-and-so because I listened to him and he preaches the gospel. He did that day, and every now and then he does. But may I say, it's the other things that he says later on. You see, the tares have been sown among the wheat. Now, verse 27, So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, You see, the sower knew, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together. Notice this, friends, this is important. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now, this is the picture, and it's a very important picture, friends, to see and interpret. He says here, don't try to pull up the tares. Let them both grow together, and they'll finally head up, and you'll then be able to recognize tares. By the fruit you shall know them, and then by the wheat. You'll know it in time. But don't attempt to pull up tares. Now, Someone comes to me and says, Pastor McGee, do you think the world's getting better? And I say, yes, I think it's getting better. Somebody else comes and says, Dr. McGee, don't you think the world's getting worse? And I say, yes, I think the world's getting worse. And somebody that's standing there that's heard me say both says, what are you trying to do, ride the fence, trying to please everybody? That's very much unlike you, right? May I say, but both are true. The wheat's growing today. And the tires are growing today. The world's getting better. The wheat's growing, heading up. Never has been a time, frankly, when there has been as much Bible teaching as there is right now. I thank God for that. There's a great deal of it, friend. Frankly, I'd love to blanket the earth so nobody would have an excuse. But I guess I can't do that. But I'm satisfied just wherever the Lord wants me to fling out the seed, I'll fling it out. Now... What happens? Well, it grows. And I'll be honest with you. I think there's some wonderful saints of God today who love the Word of God and who will die defending it. Thank God for them. The wheat's growing, friend. But I want to tell you, there's a lot of tares. I've been a pastor a long time. And my thought, when I entered the ministry, I entered a denomination, and I entered it with the idea that I was going to clean it up. I was going to straighten them out. 
You know, a lot of the young preachers feel that way about it. And you know, they just about cleaned me out and straightened me out. I tell you, I found out I couldn't do that. And I was thankful to find out from this passage and related passages that my business today is to preach the Word. <laughs> my business today is to give out the Word of God, and I'm not around pulling up tares anymore. When I started, I tried to pull them up, and I found out that there's some trying to pull up the wheat, so I had my problems. Therefore, my business is to sow it, and I believe that is the responsibility today. Now, both are growing in the world. Now, this is a kingdom of heaven situation. Actually, it's not his church. You say, well, it's in the organized church, yes, but the organized church is not his church. His church is that invisible number. And when I say invisible, I mean they're not confined to an organization. I actually don't like that term invisible church because I find out a lot of the saints understand by that that they'd be invisible Sunday night and they're invisible at the midweek service. In fact, they're invisible a whole lot of times. But the true believers irrespective of any denomination, those that have trusted Christ and are resting in him and love his word. I think that's the real test. Therefore, this is a kingdom of heaven condition, and both are growing together today, aren't they? Don't be disturbed. He's the one that's going to put in the sickle. He's the one that's going to separate tares and wheat. I'm thankful that's not my job, because I wouldn't know, and I'm afraid I would pull up some wheat. Verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed. Now we got a different kind of seed here, friends, and this is mustard seed. Now mustard is a condiment. It has no vitamins in it. It's not wheat germ. You put it on hamburgers. You couldn't live on mustard. And mustard is not a tree. It's just a little bitty plant, by the way which a man took and he sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seed. I was rather amused the other day reading one of these young liberal preachers saying he thought this was profound. He had found out that the mustard seed is not the least of all seed. Well, now, what did the Lord mean then if it's not the least of all seed? Well, it was the least of all seeds that those people knew about in that day. And for this brother's benefit, it's a pretty small seed, by the way. We're not splitting hairs, but we seem to be splitting seeds. May I say, in desperation, they try to find errors in the book. Let's just leave it like it is. It's the smallest of seeds, friends. And it's one of the seeds that a man took and sowed in his field. And the important thing is, there may be other seeds smaller, but also it's not to become a tree either. And this one here became a tree. But when it's grown, it's the greatest among herbs. But here it becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, what you have here is the growth of Christendom, the outward growth of the organized church, the mustard seed. You see, a condiment, it adds spice to it. And a lot of people today say the church must become relevant. We must identify ourselves with the common and contemporary culture of the day. And we must just get right down there with him. Where would you get that? You don't get that out of the Word of God. May I say to you that this is the picture of that little mustard seed. I like to term this, this is the parable about the little seed that got to the vigoro. And my, how it grew. It became a tree. Big organizations today. My, how the church boasts of its big organizations, big numbers, and has very little influence, by the way. But it does have just a little mustard. And we're not to be mustard. We're to be salt. And we are not to even be pepper. And if we are, we've sure lost our pep. But here you have the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And I heard the interpretation of that several years ago that made me smile. It was a liberal interpreting it in my denomination at that time and at a church meeting. He told about how the mustard seed was growing. That was the church. And a lot of the birds were coming roosting in it. And he had a Baptist bird and a Presbyterian bird and a Nazarene bird. And I want to tell you that he had a lot of funny birds in the tree. 
But that's not what it means. The birds, our Lord's already interpreted. He said, the birds come and took away the seed. And who was the birds? He said, the birds were the enemy, was Satan. So I don't like that interpretation at all. And I'm afraid this brother was way out in left field on that one. This is Christendom, and evil has gotten into the organized church. I think we need to recognize that, and that's the reason that God's people ought to be very careful about the church that you belong to, you identify yourself with. It should be true in doctrine, but it also should be true in its actions. It should be honest and truthful. These are things that are very important. Now he gives another parable, the fourth parable. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leaven. Now, this is the parable that I would say is the key parable of the chapter. Now, let me back up and say something that ought to make this appear very important to you. First of all, the Gospel of Matthew is the key book of the Bible. Second, the 13th chapter is the key chapter of Matthew. And the 33rd verse here is the key verse of the 13th chapter. So may I put it like this? Actually, what we have here is the key verse to the Bible. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. And frankly, it's very important. This is the one that we need to look at, and I wish I had time to go into a great deal more detail, even than we can in a five-year program. Now will you notice some things here that are very important. I'll read it. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took, and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now the mustard seed, that's a different kind of seed we saw. And we saw that the birds got in the Christendom, the organized religion. Now here is one that really reveals the condition today. The kingdom of heaven today is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Now there are those that talk about the leaven of the gospel. They ought to know better. Nowhere is the leaven used as a principle of good. It's always a principle of evil. It occurs 98 times in the Bible and about 78 times in the Old Testament and about 23 times in the New Testament, and it's always used in a bad sense. Dr. Lightfoot, a great scholar, made this statement. Rabbinical writers regularly use leaven as a symbol of evil. Now, leaven's not the gospel. The three measures of meal just happen to be. Because what is the meal made out of? Why, well, it's made out of the seed. It's made out of the wheat, the grain. And that is the picture of the Word of God. What happens to it? Well, this woman comes along. And I hope you ladies listening in will forgive me for saying this. But when you find woman in a doctrinal sense in Scripture, you always find she's used as a principle of evil. In the book of Revelation, when we got there, you remember Jezebel, you've suffered that woman Jezebel to teach. Well, when she gets in that position, then it's a principle of evil. And here is a woman taking the leaven and hiding it. Now, if this is the gospel, why in the world do you hide it? It's to be shouted from the housetops. It's to be heralded to the very ends of the earth. You don't hide it at all. This is a principle of evil, if you please, and it's put into the meal, which is the Word of God. And today you find that no cult, no ism, ignores the Bible. I find today that these devil worshipers, demon worshipers, and there's a great deal of it right here in Southern California, they use the Bible, but you see they put leaven in three measures of meal. And what does leaven do? Well, leaven is a principle of corruption. You put leaven in bread, and what happens? Causes it to rise, makes it tasty, too, to the mouth. And that's the reason a great many people find a thrill in some of the cults, because, you see, unleavened bread, it's 
just blah as far as the natural taste is concerned. A little leaven really helps it. And I happen to be from the South. My mother used to make biscuits, and she'd put leaven in and put them on the back of the stove, and they'd begin to rise. And you'd come running in the kitchen, and she'd shush you. You don't want the biscuits to fall. And she'd take those biscuits and put them in the oven when they got to a certain height. And she didn't stop it by putting them in the oven and baking them. Why, it would be corruption. Have you ever seen what happens to it when you keep letting them rise? I tell you, it makes a pan of something you don't want. But when it gets to a certain place, it's very tasty. Leaven is the principle of evil. And this, I think, is one of the key interpretations of the Word of God, my friend. Now, our Lord stopped here for a moment, and he said, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I'll open my mouth in parables. I'll utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now, just nail that down. He's telling us something new here. And this is brand new. It was never revealed like this in the Old Testament at all. Now, will you notice? Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares and of the field. Now he'll interpret that for us. I've already gone over it, but let's listen to this and see whether I was accurate or not. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Well, I'm right on that. The field is the world, right on that. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, right on that. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered together and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now that is the picture of today. It's Christendom, not the church. That's exactly as it is today. You know, my Lord, he never missed, not a time. And this is as accurate a picture of today as you possibly could have. Now he goes on, and he says in verse 41, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend them which do iniquity. You see, in the kingdom, even the millennium, there's going to be evil, but it's going to be taken out. And he shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The harshest words in Scripture our Lord gave them. These words came from the gentle lips of our very wonderful Lord. Now, will you notice verse 44? We come to the fifth parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hid in a field, the which, when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, these parables, that is, we have three now that are coming up. After this one, or two, it's owing to how you look at it. But these parables that you have here have a very particular and peculiar interpretation. Of course, we can't go into detail at all today, but we will next time. Now, we're spending time here because, friends, this is important. But let me just say this now in closing today. The treasure in the field is the nation Israel. And so until next time, may the Lord richly bless you, my beloved. We'll pick up there tomorrow as the Bible bus continues in this very important chapter in Matthew. If you'd like to study further on your own, download a copy of our new Bible companion for Matthew. It's available for free download at ttb.org. I love reading each section of God's Word, reviewing each study, and then going deeper with the discussion questions. We also hear from listeners that one of their favorite resources is our Bible Bus flash drive that contains the entire five-year Bible teaching series. Everything you hear from Dr. McGee in these studies, all on one flash drive that fits in the palm of your hand. It's amazing. It also contains more than 100 of his digital booklets and all of his notes and outlines. It's available for purchase at ttb.org or when you call us at one 800 65 Bible.
Now, be sure to pray for each other today as we go out now and sow the seed of God's word in our world. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here tomorrow saving a seat on the Bible bus just for you. Our study today was made possible through your prayer and financial support. We'll meet you back here next time. In fact, we're going to do this together, Lord willing, till Jesus comes again. In which case, we'll meet you in the air.